New Year's feels really quite far away, uh, but I, I remember being at high school and my mom lifting me places. Uh, before I had a motorbike or a bicycle, my mom was my lift, uh, and I'm sure all of you moms can uh, uh, register on that one. But I remember my mom going into autopilot sometimes. Uh, we would be heading off to a friend's house and we would land up at school. Uh, or we would be heading somewhere and we would land up at the shops. Uh, we, my mom would just go into autopilot and she didn't really know exactly where she was driving, but she was driving safely and, and we would land up in all sorts of places. And, and going in autopilot can happen in different things. We can go in autopilot when we're in the office. Uh, we can go in autopilot when we're playing our favorite sport or doing our favorite hobby. And a, a few years ago, uh, I realized that I was going into autopilot with the Lord's Prayer. Uh, as I went through the Lord's Prayer, uh, I, I, I realized that I was crossing over a very critical part of the prayer. And, and like when at school, when we were meant to end up at my mate Noah's place, and we ended up at school, my mom couldn't believe that this has happened. Uh, I don't know what I was doing while she was driving. I didn't tell her off. Maybe I was just staring at my phone. Um, but that same embarrassment that my mom had, you know, well, how did this happen? How did I end up at school? It's the same embarrassment that I had when I was reading through the Lord's Prayer and I realized that I was missing this critical part of my walk with the Lord. I was so embarrassed that it had slipped by me so easily. And so in Matthew 18, uh, verses 21 to 22, uh, Jesus has just come off the back of a teaching on personal reconciliation and the disciples straight after this teaching uh, come and ask. Uh, I, I say disciples, it says Peter did, but I kind of imagine the disciples kicking Peter out. You know, Peter was the guy that asked the questions. I mean, they had just been talking about who was the greatest, and so maybe they were wanting a little recognition from Jesus. Uh, the disciples very regularly didn't get the plot. And so Jesus had been teaching, and he'd been teaching on forgiveness, and and Peter comes along and asks this question. Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? The scripture knows that humans as a whole struggle with peacemaking. I know I struggle with peacemaking. and We're going to get into some stories later on. And I'm sure they are among us the struggle with peacemaking. And maybe like the disciples, uh, I've definitely thought this question, you know, how many times must I forgive? And maybe, there, maybe there's some things from 2018 that have been carried over, some unforgiveness, bitterness, anger. But even if they're not, 2019 will have its own unique challenges. There will be conflict. As Laurie said last year in the apologetics, where two or three are gathered, there's conflict. And like the disciples, I definitely need to be brought back down on occasion. Uh, this question of Peter was meant to be a holy question. The cultural norm of the day was to forgive someone three times. And after three times, you're done with that guy or girl. And so Peter's question of, do I forgive them seven times, was a super holy question. You know, Jesus, I'm going over and above the cultural norm by more than twice. And so I can kind of imagine Peter puffing up his chest and coming to Jesus and, and wanting, some, uh, wanting some input from him, wanting him to say, you know, Peter, that is amazing that you are forgiving people seven times. You know, man, Peter, you are so holy. And I think that's what I maybe sometimes think of myself. And I need to be brought back down as, as Jesus brought back down his disciples. And his, his response was, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Now, this is not a mathematical equation in which if you times seven by 77 and, you know, you get a little score chart, you know, your husband or your wife gets a score chart, you're like, huh, I've forgiven you that many times. You're done. It's not a numerical number, it's a shock number. 
What Jesus is trying to say is your level of forgiveness is unending. It's boundaryless. There's, no, there's nothing that can happen that you cannot forgive. And it doesn't matter how many times, over and over. And, and, and I think Jesus is the only person that can say this because when I look at my life and my repetitive sins, I know I can come to Jesus every single time and get genuine forgiveness. He's the only one that can say that. And so only Jesus has the authority to say such a statement of this ultimate forgiveness, of unending reconciliation. And, and I, I've really been looking forward to this uh, picture. My, my journey of conflict is, is not exemplar at all. Uh, it doesn't re- necessarily look like this. I don't think I'll go as, as far as uh, this old couple. Maybe in 60 years' time, I'll let you know. But the old man says to his wife, whenever I get mad at you, you never seem to get upset. How do you manage to control your temper? And the, old, uh, the wife says, I just go and clean the toilet. How does that help? I use your toothbrush. <laughs> uh, coming from Cape Town, I've probably got a bit more of a passive-aggressive. Uh, uh, and I... I'm an ostrich. I really don't like conflict. Uh, I stick my head in the sand. I get, I don't know if any of you guys can register with this one. I get this faint buzzing in my head. Words disappear. My heart rate rockets. I, I just, I, I, I really dislike it. I would much rather be anywhere else but in conflict. I struggle to speak. I struggle to think. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that struggles in this way with conflict. And so hopefully as we, as we journey through, as we journey through some texts, that we get to sow peace in 2019 because our world seriously needs it and our lives seriously need it. In all of our workspace, in all of our family, uh, I was just doing some, some, Google, um, some Google searches and the amount of articles that there are on uh, stress disorders in which when families come together, Conflict is rife. And so let's consider five verses of the Bible that deal with the topic of forgiveness. And this is just a simple starting point of of conflict resolution. By no means are these five verses exhaustive of the Bible's narrative of forgiveness. Uh, It is just five verses within Scripture. And so our first two verses is in Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 1 verse 18. And you can read them up there. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And chapter 1, verse 18, which came before, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And so my first point of call, when, when I come to a conflict situation... The first point of call that I need to remember is I need to reflect upon the gospel because most of the time I don't want to be reconciled because that person hurt me. I, I, want, I want them to feel my hurt. I, I, I want to do something back. I want to retaliate. I want to gossip. I want to do anything else but forgive. And I need Jesus. And I often need to reflect upon the gospel. And, and how does that help? Because the gospel is all about forgiveness that Jesus has given me. But I very rarely hand that same forgiveness out. And we need to reflect upon the gospel. We need to consider what Christ has given and use that as our strength and our starting point as handing out. And this, is, and this is what God has done. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, and I made it really big, primarily because if I just made it in 44, the rest of the fonts, it, it looked a bit funny, but also just so you can't miss it. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. This is the gospel. While we were still weak, while we could not save ourselves, At the right time, Jesus wasn't an oopsie baby. Uh, Jesus wasn't a mistake. 
uh, he was brought down by the Lord through the Virgin Mary, and he died for the ungodly. Jesus Christ, God the Son, died for us. That's the gospel. And I really, truly believe that reconciliation, true reconciliation, cannot truly happen without Jesus at the center. And so if you are struggling with conflict going into 2019, a great starting point is to give your life to Jesus. Because if I didn't have Jesus in my life, I wouldn't want to forgive a bunch of people, including my brother. And so if you are struggling with forgiveness, accept Jesus, because Jesus forgave us of ungodliness. And the Lord doesn't want our relationships with work and family and with our friends to be unreconciled. And he wants us to reflect upon the gospel. And I, I think the most powerful example of this was uh, with, my, with my oldest brother. In 2012, he got divorced uh, from, from, his, uh, from his wife. Um, he had been doing some naughty stuff. And my brother was always the hero in, in my dreams. Uh, he was always the hero in my thoughts. He was the, the Aragorn of Lord of the Rings, you know, Goku of Pokemon or uh, Goku of whatever that one is. Uh, he, was, he was the hero, and I looked up to him. I wanted to be my oldest brother. I was the youngest. And then he went and, and did some silly things and got divorced, and it really, really hurt me. And I remember for about two weeks, I was just kind of like a blank, a blank slate. Uh, I didn't really engage in much conversation, and I found myself just kind of staring at the wall and and I suddenly realized that I was stuck in a state of unforgiveness. And I was doing a, a huge injustice to my brother because Jesus has forgiven me of my sins. And what a hypocrite am I to not forgive my brother for what he has done. And so Jesus humbled me and got to see through the gospel that I was not loving, I was not being a, a, a son of God. I was being a pent-up sinner. And I needed to forgive my brother. That doesn't mean that I have forgotten what he's done. That doesn't mean that it's changed our relationship. But I needed to forgive him for his sake and, for my, and particularly for my own sake. Uh, having bitterness towards someone else and being cold towards them is, is almost like wanting them to die and you drinking the poison doesn't always work out. And so now that we, now that we have Jesus in our lives, uh, if you need to ask Jesus into your life today, please do. We're going to pray later about that, or maybe if you want to chat to someone else. Uh, you don't need to chat to Murray and I. Uh, we are all the priests that are believers. Um, but if you do want to chat to Murray and I, uh, we will gladly pray with you guys um, and lead you to Jesus. But now that we do have Jesus... The, the next three verses are Matthew 7, 5, Proverbs 19, 11, and Matthew 18, 15. We're just going to look at each one because my second point of call, my first point of call was look at the gospel when conflict comes. My second point of call is look at the other side of the coin. Uh, usually, as soon as conflict comes, I stick my head in the soil. But I know that there are others. Uh, I won't point any fingers because she's not here. Uh, that goes straight for the jugular. She studied law, and she has no problem about conflict. Uh, when you spend time with their family, that's what happens. Two very different conflict styles. And I, and I need to remember that they are two sides of the coin. I, I need to remember that I, I, I shouldn't just stick my head in the soil. And there are three starting points, three stops. Three stop streets that we can use just to try and help us to, like me, not to evade conflict or not like this particular lady and just run to conflict. And the first one is Matthew chapter 7 verse 5. And you can read it up at the top. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. 
And I'm sure we've heard this. It's a, it's a common, common saying. The word for log here, it's, it's almost comical. Uh, Jesus is saying uh, what, what kind of tree would be around here. Like a massive gum tree. Get the gum tree out of your eye so that you can get the toothpick out of your friend's eye. And I think this one is teaching some self-reflection. When, I, when I'm facing conflict, it's very easy to consider the fault of the other person or the other people. It's very easy. I can, you know, if I had to draw up a list of faults of others and fault of me, I will go to faults of others first and I'll fill that up pretty quickly. And then get to me and you're like, uh, I don't know. We need to self-reflect. Most of the time, we have done just as much wrong as the other person has. You have done just as, and I've done just as much to help the conflict, put just as much paraffin into the fire as the other person. And so self-reflection is a great, a great thing to do. And, and remember what, what Laurie said about we must remember to think. What did the think stand for? Let's do some 2018 reflection. Laurie's not around. She's not listening. What was the first one? Is it? Is it true? What's the, what does the H stand for? Is it helpful? What does the I stand for? I forgot what the I stands for, so I was hoping someone would say it. <laughs> Inspiring. Thank you, Ali. N. Is it necessary? And K, is it kind? I think that's a great way to go through. If, if you are brooding over a conflict and, and uh, you just need to do some self-reflection, you just need to remember to think. The second uh, stop street to help us not to just run into or run away from conflict is Proverbs 19.11. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Not every conflict requires our determination to ignore it or explode in it. Sometimes we just need a good dose of common sense. Sometimes I need to regularly remind myself uh, and fight against these thoughts. In, in marriage, Tara and I are going into our, our fourth year now, um, and sometimes thoughts come into mind of, oh, well, she always does this. She always does that. Why does she do this? Why does she do that? She, she always does this. And, and then when I, when I reflect, I realize she doesn't. And, and, even if, and even if she could, she doesn't want to because she loves me. Somehow these, these thoughts get into our mind and, and small things uh, get uh, put into mountains. And I think it's those closest to us that irritate us the most. Uh, my, going back to my brothers, my, my, uh, my middle brother, uh, he was two years older than me and I, I do love him, although I think when I was growing up I didn't love him too much. He knew exactly how to press my buttons. He could get me angry quicker than nothing else, even, even quicker than driving nowadays. And, the, and one of his favorite things to do was, uh, he, he was a great mechanic, and somehow he had tracked down these super hectic fireworks. Like, you know the ones that are on Christmas crackers? That you pull and make the little bang? But he found, like, crackers of that. Like, explosions that do that. And so he would tripwire my entire bedroom, from my door to my cupboard to my window to everything, and he knew if he, if, he, if he got me angry, I would just go into my room and start opening stuff, not checking what was there. And so he knew I was going to go, and he knew I was at the TV, so he had all the time in the world to go and booby trap my entire room. And so he would, he would do that. And then once he had set up the room efficiently, he would come and stand in front of the TV and get me going in like 10 seconds, and I'd storm off to the room, and then he would just sit there basking in the explosions. Uh, unfortunately, he did it many times, but sometimes some things just need to be overlooked. But the question is, when is it necessary to overlook? Because 
Christians have, in the, in the, in the past, um, become punching bags. And this can be uh, a, a sore point in, in life in which you just overlook everything and you never take conflict on and you put it as a mask of holiness. I know I've done that. Where, where I think I'm being so holy, but in fact, I'm just being dumb. Because I'm not dealing with conflict. I'm just overlooking it and letting it brood inside of me. And so when is it wise to overlook? And I think that's where the good sense comes in. If, if, what is, if what is happening is causing you mental or physical harm, you must deal with it. If it is causing your relationship to Jesus to be hindered, you must deal with it. If, if every time that person comes up, you remember X, Y, or Z, and you start to feel bitterness, you must deal with it. If in the next conflict you have, you carry the rucksack, and every time you have the conflict, you, you take out the rucksack, and the things that you overlooked, you bring out in the conflict, you must deal with those things. So some things can be overlooked, but some things shouldn't be. But I think if, we be, if I be honest in my own life, if we be honest, most conflict situations can simply just be overlooked. Our default should be one of love and forgiveness. I mean, that's what Jesus' response out of this, this Matthew text when Peter asks the question, and he says, no, you must forgive 70 times, 70 times, then he goes into a parable that explains how the kingdom is a kingdom of forgiveness and peace. And our last stop street is Matthew eighteen fifteen. So if we need to start seeking, if we cannot overlook it, and we need to start seeking forgiveness... If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. Not as always as easy as said. It's much easier to gossip. Much easier to tell someone else X, Y. Or bring it up even sometimes in prayer requests. But the Bible says we must talk it out privately, not loudly, not publicly, not behind backs. But if someone has hurt you, you must go talk to them. And I think that is some, some great wisdom. Uh, there's, there's something about Jesus' teachings that for 2,000 years no one has been able to top the ethics and the wisdom that Jesus teaches in the Gospels, no one has been able to top for 2,000 years. And I think this is some proper wisdom. When when I'm dealing with conflict in 2019, talk to the person first. After you've uh, used the think tactic, go talk to the person. But what does it actually mean to forgive someone? If, if, if I say, I forgive you, what am I telling that person? What am I telling the person that I say, I forgive? Uh, I would say that forgiveness doesn't mean that future interactions are not affected or that the problem is not forgotten in our mind, but I, I, say, I would say it doesn't affect our actions or our thinking towards the person. It, it doesn't bring back pain or hatred or, uh, or every time you think of that person, you think of what they've done. Or every time you're in a conflict with that person, you want to bring out everything they've done because you just want to make them feel as worse as possible so that you win the argument. Forgiveness is a tricky thing. And, and guys who are far cleverer than I, some psychologists, uh, define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance towards a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they are actually deserving of your forgiveness. 
And so in our, in our conflict, as we face conflict in 2019, uh, as we face old conflict from years gone by into 2019, uh, may we consider the gospel. Because if you don't consider the gospel, you, like me, it's going to have a tough time doing the act of forgiving. And if you do need to deal with conflict, remember that uh, you can overlook an offense if necessary. And you can talk it out. And remember that you also play a role, and I play a role, in conflict. So, in conclusion, it should be simple to distinguish what part of the Lord's Prayer I had noticed due to this autopilot. Any guesses, any stabs that people want to maybe air out? Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. I, I don't know whether it was the excitement of the first phrase, forgive me my sins, and then you kind of just ramble the rest and you, you're still basking in the glory of my sins being forgiven, or, or maybe I just didn't want to, or maybe I didn't know how to. But part of being forgiven by Jesus is to forgive others. The kingdom is all about forgiveness. Jesus doesn't want unforgiveness in his kingdom. Uh, he died to bring peace. And so we need to be peace givers. As we, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, it is an amazing prayer of what Jesus Christ has done for us, but it's also a, a, a hard commitment because peacemaking is tough. It requires a lot of self-reflection, it requires a lot of love. It requires a lot of patience. And sometimes it's just downright hard to do. To be courageous enough to go speak to someone, you've hurt me. Sometimes you just need a huge dollop of, of power and wisdom from the Holy Spirit <laughs> just to go and do that. And so as we end, I, I just want to read the Lord's Prayer. And hope that none of us, including myself, uh, go into autopilot as we, as we pray it. So please do join me in praying it. And, and if you need to pray for the first time for Jesus to forgive you, use this time. Or if you need to uh, come back to Jesus, use this time. Or if you just need to uh, continue establishing your relationship with Jesus, use this time. And, and ask for strength uh, and wisdom and power to be reconcilers in this world. And so pray with me. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. So, Father, we just, we just thank you for your spirit. We thank you for Jesus who came and at the right time died for the ungodly, he came to bring reconciliation and peace to men. And I pray that we do the same to others. But, Lord, this is a tough calling. And I do not have the strength on my own to forgive. Uh, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need your spirit. I need you to uh, empower me, strengthen me, give me wisdom, give me love, give me patience. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray for each one of us to sow peace into our family, into our friends, into our work, into strangers' lives. Lord, the world needs love, the world needs peace. And Lord, we particularly think of the elections coming in 2019. Lord, I pray that peace reigns and may it start with us as we live lives that are worthy of the calling that we have received as we be reconcilers, as we forgive one another. And Lord, let us not uh, think any forgiveness is teeny tiny. For Lord, we do not know whether this uh, act of forgiveness to a friend or family member can bring them to know Jesus, can bring them closer to you. 
and can mend hurting and broken years of lives. But Lord, you forgave the most ultimate, the most ultimate sin, the most ultimate pain, the most ultimate hurt. And so, Lord Jesus, there is nothing on earth that can be greater or more severe or more disgusting than what we have done to you and what you forgave us. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your amazing forgiveness, that we can come to you every day and ask for renewed forgiveness as, as we continually reject you, as we continually uh, step aside and neglect your ways. Lord, if we are struggling with unforgiveness, I pray that you help us to reflect upon you and your Son. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that everyone here may experience love and peace and joy as they come out from the service, as they talk with one another, as they uh, just commune with each other. Lord Jesus, may no one leave here this morning uh, not experiencing your love and your grace and your faithfulness. Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.